You're listening to Just, stories about the people working to build thriving communities rooted in justice. I'm Jess Averhart, co-founder of Black Wall Street Homecoming. And I'm Rob Shields, executive director of the ReCity Network. All right, look, so here's why we're here. We're here to get proximate. We're here to listen. We're here to process. And we're here to help you process. But here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to be preachy because we don't have all the answers. And we will never make you feel like an outsider. Keeping with the theme of sharing... We always want to acknowledge the whole person, and that starts with our personal, personal check-in. check-in. Let's do it. Well, well, well. And that, we're back. And see, I just wanted to that, see how intentional I was to make it sound different than I always. I wanted that to mix was it up. Good. That really was. That was a nice. Uh, <laughs> that was a nice opener. I'm sure our listeners are waiting for the traditional, but you're like, uh-huh. well, well, well. Nope, well, not going to do it. Back. I'm not going to do it. They're going to be like, are we listening to the right podcast? Because That's I'm right. used to Rob saying the exact same thing every time. Nope. Not going to give it to you. How you doing, friend? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, enjoying the sunny day. It's been like a little bit of a mixed bag. So I'm excited about our guest today. The sun is out. I got my vaccination. Since the whole world wants to talk about that, I figure we might as well give them what they want. They're then begging the question, which one did you get? I got J and J. What other bases do we need to cover? Is that it? That's pretty much it for J and J. I think so. I don't. Yeah. I, you got I, yours. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, one did you get? I got the Moderna. Yep. Mm-hmm. And are you yep. on the first or the second? I've gotten my second. And yep, I'm feeling and honestly, I wanted to be sicker after number two than I was. I know this is probably not the right platform to share this type of thing, but I'm notoriously a a big wimp when it comes to being sick. But with four kids, I was kind of like, oh, if I can have an excuse to be in bed, like I can't move. But yo, your wife is going to listen to this. What is she she already knows? She already knows. I she it was like it was so clear that I was not affected. And (laughs) and I was I was wanting to be I wanted to be have a reason to lay on the couch and I didn't get it. So I, uh, woe is me. I didn't have any. Yeah. No side one effects. feels sorry for you, but no one. I'll try. I'll pretend for the sake of this podcast. You well, can. so other than that, I'm good. I mean, I think that was the thing, right? I'm just like, so I laugh now. It's just a, a cute cultural vernacular moment is that everybody wants to talk about your vaccination process and, or if you're getting the vaccine, that's the other thing, right? Some people mm-hmm. are like adamant about not doing it. So Anyways, we've covered those bases and we'll never have to talk about it again, which I'm grateful for. Let's, <laughs> we covered it. We can move on. We'll Other see. than that, things are good. Yeah, no, until the next global crisis, right? There'll be something else. So that's how I'm doing. How are you, friends? So you're fully vaccinated. Congrats. I'm and full. what else is going on? Let's see. Quick hits. My March Madness bracket did terrible this year. Mm, Just absolutely mm-hmm. bad. I thought this year, because of everything else going on, my ignorance would actually make me do better. But mm-hmm. my, I stayed in mediocrity, but I didn't lose too much money with to my friends. So that's good. Other than it's that, never fun to lose a bracket with a lot of money on the line. So if you're working with play money, it doesn't really matter. Who is it? First of all, is it over? I don't even know. Is it? It is over. Not at the time of this recording, it's not over, but it will be over by the time our listeners hear it. So okay. I, we could try to guess who won, but it won't be messed. It will be even messed. It will be a mess. Yeah. I always root for Gonzaga because I like to say their names. And I lo- I'm from Ohio, so I always play with Dayton because they're always an underdog. Are any of them in the final whatever? Gonz- Gonzaga's in the final four. Gonzaga. I hitched my wagon to the Baylor Bears. And if they win, I get a free dinner for my friend. But if they lose, I've got to pay for their dinner. So I've got a, I've got a crew of guys that I do that with every we find a way to compete and all it's just it's, a dinner is usually on the line yeah, because worst case scenario, everybody wins because we all get to fellowship with each other. So it's not a, I'm not, yeah. not losing thousands of dollars. Yeah. Just a steak dinner, maybe just a steak dinner. Yeah. So it's yeah. even when you lose, you win. That's right. I'm into that. There you go. No. Yeah. Speaking of sports, I, <laughs> I want to welcome on our guest now because she is probably one of the craziest sports fans I know. And it's a good year to be a fan of her sports teams, Elizabeth Butler. Can you hear us? Are you on? Hey, Rob, I am here. You are here. Hey, Elizabeth. 
Hey, Jessica. Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. That's probably what you are most known for in your it life. Is. Yeah. You know, it's my biggest accomplishment, sticking in there when times was tough and waiting until Tom Brady came and made us champions. It yes, is. yes. <laughs> Misery no more, right? You're just playing with house money at this point, going for number two. But that's not why we had you on. That's I may have told you, I may have oversold that a little bit when I try to recruit you on this podcast. Say, we're just going to talk about Tom Brady the whole time. But no, for those of you who are listening in, who don't know, I'll have the, the privilege and blessing to know Elizabeth Butler. She is the employment team manager with one of the most impactful organizations I've ever had the blessing to come across, Step Up Durham, ReCity partner, been working up close with them for over five years now and just doing incredible things. And I'm going to, I'm going to let Elizabeth go into all of her bio because, you know, (laughs) she's, she wears a lot of hats and she can probably pepper in a, a few of those stories along the way. But I just wanted to frame up for our listeners, this conversation before we jump in to Elizabeth kind of sharing more for, from her story. So Step Up Durham, they work as a mission. Their mission statement is to, for adults and children transforming their lives through employment and life skills training with a vision to be the premier resource in Durham County for people seeking to improve their lives and develop stable careers. So they are in solidly in the workforce development space. They do it better than anybody that I've ever seen. And if you don't know, frame out the the, the wide problem, which Elizabeth is probably going to dive into here a little bit more. A lot of this information can be found on their website. The problem they're tackling, 1.6 million people in North Carolina have a criminal record, which translates to almost one in five adults. And Step Up Durham works, about 60% of their clientele are people who are formerly incarcerated, who are looking to secure employment and navigating all the hurdles that come with that so that they can personally flourish, their families can flourish, and their communities can flourish. And so Elizabeth is doing the good work of really coming alongside people in the community who lack consistent, stable employment and helping them overcome those barriers because it really takes a village to do that. And and Step Up Durham is one of the villages that I've seen that do that so phenomenally well. So we have not really had a podcast dedicated to all the amazing work that Step Up Durham has done, even though they're one of our best partners. And so I'm, I, I can't believe it's taking us this long, but I'm so excited for, for this conversation. So Elizabeth, welcome on. And I'm excited for our listeners to hear more mm-hmm. of you. Let, let's just kick it off. I just want them to, to hear, turn the floor over to you. Tell us your story and how you became passionate about the work that you do. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I came to Step Up Durham through a roundabout way. I got out of prison in 2012 and didn't have a community, didn't have family and friends in this state who would help me transition and start this new life. So the week I got out, I heard about Step Up and I joined that program. And then I went through that week and I ended up with employment. And then I went through the year long process to try to stabilize my life. And then I became an alumni. And when an opportunity arose to work at Step Up, that's that's where I came and where I've been ever since. So I work numerous jobs, but Step Up is always my priority. It's always the goal. Why am I passionate about this? Because March 22nd made nine years that I've been home from prison. And I still cannot rent an apartment in my own name by myself anywhere in, in North Carolina. I've tried and tried and tried. Mm-hmm. Coming out of the transitional house, I had to live in a hotel for over a year and a half. Then you find a private owner and then you go through all of that where you're paying way too much money because they know you have not a lot of other options. Right. So I'm grateful that finally in November I was able to move to Durham, but I still had to get a co-signer, someone else to vouch for me. My credit's where it needs to be. My income's where it needs to be. The work I do is in place. And that background keeps me from being what they consider worthy of an opportunity to just be independent. And so when we beat people each and every day who say, I'm looking for work and they have the right attitude, they have the drive and the discipline, but what's holding them back is a background. You're not telling them that it's behind them, like a background really is. You're telling them that's your present story. And we believe that's not true. And so we Mm. fight every day, right? Because our people are fighting. And who are we to tell them they're not worthy? We're here to tell everybody, like, you're missing out if you don't give this person a chance because they'll go 100% harder than anyone else. Mm, I love that. Yes. That's a way to kick us off. Well done. <laughs> I do. I have a million questions. I, I love questions. This is great. I think probably what our listeners are thinking is like I was thinking like, man, still after, what did you say? Nine, nine years. Nine, nine years. years. 
yo, that is unbelievable to me. I mean, it's just a hard thing for me to wrap my mind around. So I appreciate you sharing that because that in and of itself is just a really important statistic and policy, I guess, that we should be aware of. And then just listening to you and hearing your story, like you got this, like you're rocking this out. So come on, let's let's catch up. Like our state and our mm-hmm. policies need to catch up. Okay, so before I go off into things I don't know a lot about, <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't speculate. I need to really get into <laughs> questions. So you can provide all of the expertise here. Mm. Let's talk about the folks that Step Up serves. And you know this intimately well, but it's not just formerly incarcerated individuals, right? You have folks who have experienced homelessness or experiencing homelessness or in transitional housing, substance Mm -hmm. abuse. Just, I mean, there's a whole litany of statistics around that, that I'm privy to, I can see, but I'd love for you to just add color to the folks that you serve and that are in our community that Step Up is doing the good work around. Yeah, so we partner, one of our biggest partners is actually Urban Ministries of Durham, where Mm -hmm. they're sending the residents there to gain employment because housing without uh, income isn't going to work, right? So Mm -hmm. we partner together. You have the families from Families Moving Forward. So these transitional programs that they're in, the shelters, a lot of the reentry houses, as you said, but not everyone is struggling with substance abuse or criminal backgrounds or even homelessness. We serve anyone who's 18 and older, who is really physically able and ready to go to work is who we're going to partner with. We have people sometimes who have even their bachelor's degree and they're not even to get a job. Our focus, our majority does tend to be those who are homeless, those who have substance abuse. What I find though, and what I believe and why I'm excited to work in Durham and why I loved ReCity is because I feel like Durham is a place that says, okay, we know that it's been hard, but if you're ready, you can do better. And we want to help you make, you know, make that possible. And so a lot of people who have had a harder life or who have had these situations, it doesn't mean they want to stay there. It just means they need an opportunity. And what a place to work where you can create opportunities, right? Yeah, that's really good. Go ahead, Rob. I was going to ask about a day in life, but go ahead. We'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of want to have ask a follow-up question because I feel like there's so much educating that you guys do, Elizabeth, watching your program up close. You're educating the community along the way as to just mm-hmm. how complex and convoluted these systems are that we ask individuals to navigate. And yet you walk this line of, you don't take away people's dignity in assuming they don't have the means or asking them to step up. Literally it's in your name. Like they have it within themselves to be able to do amazing things. Mm -hmm. And yet the same thing is true. They are having to navigate really broken realities. Even the ones that you're alluding to after nine years, this story that was your past is still in your present kind of causing barriers, I mean, you, that's what allows you to be able to empathize with the clients that you serve so, so beautifully. I guess my question is around that education piece, if you had to name one thing that you just wish more people understood mm-hmm. that said, if they, if they understood this, it would really transform the way people view our work and, and the, what we do and would make such a great impact in our community. And what change would you make if you had in previous episodes, we've said waving the magic wand. If you could wave it over one thing that would make the biggest difference, what would that be? I wish people would close their eyes and look. Don't mm. look at what that person looks like in front of you. Don't look at what you're going to see on paper. Don't look at what they're wearing. Listen to them talk about their work skills. Listen to the most insecure person, the most shy person in the world. Ask them about, hey, so I see you do carpentry. Tell me about that and watch them. Like you can hear the passion in their voice. Sometimes we get so busy looking that we're missing it. We're just missing it. One thing that I almost appreciate about this past year of COVID is that it forced a lot of people into unemployment. It forced a lot of people into the situation where they never thought they'd find themselves because they set up their life for success, right? They did all the right things and they have college and this and that, but now they're put in the same perspective as our participants who didn't have access to some of these things for whatever. The access certain demographics had all their life were taken away because COVID affected us all. And I'm hoping that brings about more compassion. Durham's already a great city, but I'm hoping this makes us truly neighbors and truly a community all around instead of separate. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I like that. That's a great charge. Truly, it is. Especially after COVID. I mean, some of that Mm. level setting, I mean, we need to, yeah, that's a really good charge. 
With COVID, a lot of people faced isolation and mental health really was impacted during this time, right? People felt depression and anxiety from being alone and isolated. And I want them to remember that's what our participants feel too. Because they're coming from transitional houses or um, shelters or substance abuse, people see them and stay away. And so they're constantly walking around in isolation. So what many of us experienced for one year they've been dealing with four years and are still perseverant and persistent enough to show up for our workshop and say, I'm ready. If you just give me an opportunity, I will be the best employee they ever had. And so mm. I'm asking everyone to remember what it felt like to be alone during this past year. Mm. Realize that there's people who've been alone for a lifetime and have not given in to despair, are still ready to go to work. Elizabeth, talk to me about what you do every day. So like now we get it. We got a foundation, right? We get it. We, we know who, what you're the good work. We know you're serving. But like, I suspect you are doing yeoman's work and you have a 50,000 plates in the air. So maybe tell us about 20 of those. So I believe in being a servant leader, right? Like I'm, I'm a servant leader and there's a member of my team. He said something that impacted me so much last year that I've carried it every day, which is like every day when he goes to bed, he's poured himself out, right? Like he's done everything. So if his life is over, he's given everything he's had. So mm. it's wake up. Sometimes I have my first meeting at 7 a.m. And then I'm going to meet my participant. For example, last week I had a one on one with a participant and then another participant got a job and she needed to work clothes. So I shot over and got her clothes and then took her back and got her to the interview and then had meetings and then meet with the community. And then, yeah, I do that all day because I have a car and I have the access and I know people. So I just spend all day trying to make it happen for our participants. And sometimes, sometimes a participant just needs you to sit with them so they can say all the things because it's not always easy. And some days it sucks and you're allowed to say that it sucks. Mm. And I do dark and twisty well. So I might drive over <laughs> to where my participant lives. And one of my parents, she had cancer. And so she is going through treatments right now and isn't doing so well. So once a week, I just take a cup of tea over and sit on her porch with her since I can't go inside and just let her, if she doesn't want to talk, she doesn't have to, but if she mm. does, right? So sometimes all you can do is show up. I spend every day showing up. That's what mm. I do. Wow. Mm. I love that. That's what, what's not great, Rob. Just that's such mm. a good example of community. Yeah. I know we're on this podcast. I'm having like all kinds of feelings about this. <laughs> It's just so good. It's so good. We don't do community like that. I love that, Elizabeth. Mm. Thank you for sharing mm. how you do community because we can talk about it, but just to hear how you put that in action uh, is really special. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you, you, you're just painting a, a really beautiful picture. I think you're right of what community looks like and what it means to show up for our neighbor. And I think that's what Elizabeth does. That, that honestly, we all could aspire to do better in our lives, regardless of whether we work for a step up Durham or not, is to look to be a better neighbor and modeling the values that Elizabeth is talking about. Just that ministry of presence that she just says, like you're hustling, you're constantly on the lookout of being others focused and that servant lens that you take in the way you view the people that you serve, the empathy in which you carry yourself in those situations, getting proximate and just being willing to love them and do for them. Right. Yeah. And I think laying your head down at night. I know. And just having emptied yourself after a whole day. And I think the statistics of what you guys do as an organization back up the tenacity in which you do your work. And I want to shift to talking a little bit more about how you envision success, kind of almost like a, that in-game vision. But yeah. I want to set you up by, I'll go ahead and rattle off all your stats because I know you're also too humble to probably say any of this <laughs> stuff. So I'm going to brag on you and your team for a second because it's okay. crazy. So over the past six years, you guys have served over a thousand individuals through your program. In the last fiscal year, it's been, you found 116 job placements. You're earning $13 and 14 cents an hour at least or more. 85% went, individuals went from no income to at least $11 and 23 cents an hour, from zero to at least 11 bucks an hour. And just to frame up the powerful thing about, about all these stats, the, on your website, you paint this narrative of the, the cost to actually incarcerate an individual per yeah. year yeah. is over $35,000. Yeah. And when you quantify the, what you guys do to help people who are 
for avoid recidivism, yeah. avoid mm-hmm. reoffending yeah. is three thousand dollars. So so yeah. le- less than ten percent uh, from a fiscal standpoint, you're able to have a profound impact on helping keep that money being paid to keep people locked up. Yeah. And towards flourishing is unbelievable. When you can sit, can, can consider that North Carolina's average recidivism rate is 40%, but the people that come through step up is 6%. I'm like, our <laughs> listeners need to be hearing this. And they're like, they are doing it. It is changing lives and it is to be applauded. And what I want you to do, Elizabeth, is like framing that up. When I read off all those things, help make that come to life for our listeners, because those are statistics, but yeah. you work with you work with people. What stands out? What are the most meaningful measures of success for you being so close yeah. to this work? And what is your ultimate hope? What do you hope for your organization? What do you hope for kind of the end game vision of where you guys are going? <laughs> I can picture Sarita right now because I always have all the big ideas. So I can picture her shaking her head. I love Sarita. And I think it does start at the head, right? So having an executive Mm -hmm. director who will go out there and do the work and do the fight. And she, I think executive directors sometimes are so separated from the work and that's how it should be because they have a lot of responsibilities at their level. But there's never a time when we can say our participant needs and she doesn't have the end of that sentence so I think like I just mm. want to honor that for a second and say like when you mm. have an entire organization who's participant focused, I think this is the result. So mm. we do the first step is step one. We do a three day w- workshop. What's been beautiful is right. Usually we cannot serve those on the sex offender registry because we're in churches, we're in schools. Virtually we're able to serve them. In the past 30 days, we graduated 14. And in the past 30 days, 15 have gotten jobs. So I want you to hear that one more person than even graduated our workshop has gotten employed. That means everybody's working. And that's amazing to me that they have criminal backgrounds, that they maybe are homeless and don't have transportation, that they don't have technology. Whatever the, someone's story is, we, we're able to like work with them around that, right? It's not a barrier. It's just, let's not figure out how to go through it. Let's figure out how to go over it. So it's mm. never a barrier again. So that's the jobs team focus. And I am so thankful for our team because I'm definitely a structure organization, get it done type person. Bill is the one who taught me slow down and be there with someone, right? So mm-hmm. we're learning from each other. We're not just asking participants to learn. We're saying challenge each other. We yeah. have to do better to serve because their situations keep getting worse. So I love our team for that. Now someone goes into step two because they're working 25 hours or more a week. They have income and we're setting up financial education courses, entrepreneurship courses, whatever it is that you want, because it's not just about getting a job and even keeping a job. If most of our people are coming out of transitional homes, that means that they're going to need housing, correct? Housing is hard. It is just hard, especially when you have barriers to that. So how can we set our people up so they can transition? Everything is constantly a step. Partnering with Wheels for Hope where you can buy a car for six fifty. dollars So if we know that part of their goal in step one is to buy a car, we need to make sure you can make enough money to pay off whatever you need to pay off to save and get that car by the time you finish step two. It's about building out a life. My big dream, my big dream is somehow when someone finishes that year of step two, Because for us, renting is so hard, how can we partner with Habitat and get home ownership on the table? How can we make it where you never have to feel that shame again of trying to rent because you're working towards buying? You own this and no one can make you move, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I want the answers that take away people's opportunity to judge. That's what I want for our participants. Yes, yes. All right. Well, I want to ask you what gives you hope. And the funny part of this question is I'm just interested if you'll reframe it differently, but you've been sharing stories and wellsprings of hope this entire interview. So when you think about narrowing it down, what gives you hope in the work, maybe what's your why too, those might be different, but I'm really interested in if you were to like, just get uh, incredibly focused on on what is providing that spark in the morning that gets you up. What would you? How would you describe that? What's that for you? So I'm sorry, I will reframe it, but that's just because I operate from a place. I think that's it's hopeful, but it's not hopeful. I operate from a place of having been sick, having been homeless, having 
faced loss, having been incarcerated, not having a college education. I don't have a college education and I have a felony. I am a teacher at Wake Tech since 2016. It's that, that you just have to be willing to work. The hope is every participant that comes to our workshop, that's really the hope. They have that same fire in them. I know they do. Yeah. And if we can just wake it up, right? We can just wake it up. On Tuesdays, they come to class and they're like, I don't really want to be here, but I'm mm. going to do it. And by Thursdays, when we do graduation, we speak over each person. Each one of us on the team picks a person we speak over them. And if you've never seen someone who's so shy that they can't talk on Tuesday, and then you say something and they cry on Thursday because you've seen them, we all want to be seen. I think we all want our pain acknowledged. We don't want pity. We just want someone to say, I understand it's hard, and I'm going to be here with you in the hard place until you get to the other side, right? And then you make it easier for the person coming behind you too. I think that's the hope, right? That we can just pour out what we have and it's going to spread into the whole community. Yeah, Mm. I love that. That's it. Mm. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's so true. Everyone does. And that's that's such a great equalizer. Everyone wants to be seen. Everyone wants to have their pain acknowledged. And I would argue everyone has that spark in them and that's what that's what's so beautiful about your work, Elizabeth. You're coming alongside. You're fanning those sparks into flame, and because you believe that potential is there, and you're going to be that advocate to yeah. build them up, and then go and also be that that what's the sports analogy here? Like the person that clears the way. I don't know, blocker, something. Uh, pick your. <laughs> pick, I don't. Why I'm never drawing blanks on sports analogies, and I'm doing it right now. You're going. You feel all the pressure. <laughs> I will. That's because you're the football fan here. You tell me what position that is on the field. I don't yeah, know. Tell you. Go ahead. Right. You're going to leave me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's fine. That's fine. All right. That's fine. It's because I'm not a Bucks fan. But you're, I just feel like the word holistic comes to mind because you're just touching on almost every aspect of what I think it really means to help serve someone holistically in the way that you model it, but also in the way that you've touched on housing, you've touched on transportation. You've also touched on the fact that Step Up Durham can't alone help somebody flourish holistically because to solve housing without an income doesn't work, right? You've got to have transportation to be able to get to a job, to be able to then afford that house. Like all of these things are so interconnected. And I think that's what I appreciate so much about y'all's work is that you approach, you serve the whole person and you show up with all of yourself uh, to be able to do that. And I think our listeners are tracking with that hundred percent. You yeah. know what I love about Step Up Durham and, and Durham as a whole is the collaboration, right? Like you mm. said, we can't do everything. Durham yeah. has some amazing community partners. Like we have amazing partners and that's what I love, right? That we're an organization who doesn't try to hoard all of our resources and none, none of the other organizations that partner with us are hoard. And we just collaborate, we work together. And I think if you're trying to model what community looks like for a participant, you have to be part of one first. Amen. Amen. I love <laughs> it. So you've got our, our, our listeners are excited at this point. They have to be, okay. if not, something's wrong. They need to go to the doctor because the pulse might be getting a little low because <laughs> this is an amazing organization. Now they believe me. Everything that I said on the front end, you have shown them and modeled with this conversation. We love to land the plane with each of these interviews with a show up moment, something Mm -hmm. practical that says, here's how people can take a step up, maybe a step towards step up Durham to get more involved, to learn what's one step that folks can take to get more connected in your world and, and with step up. Yeah, so a great way to get connected is next Tuesday. We're doing our Impact 2021 luncheon. We will have some great information um, about our organization and what we've accomplished in the past year, as well as what is our vision going forward to continue to serve. So I'd love to have everyone show up and meet more about us. And also, if you're interested in volunteering, becoming an employment partner, or just want to talk more about it, Rob would be happy to give you my information. I love to talk and I bring coffee. I bring coffee to all meetings. So just let me know. And I'd love to share more with you about what we do. I can verify. She's telling the truth. She <laughs> she does bring coffee to meetings and it's very kind and very appreciated because <laughs> I'll never turn down a free cup of, of caffeine. So, and the website, Elizabeth, stepupdurham.org, right? Yep. Step all up one Durham. word, no she- hyphens. Yep. S-T-E-P-U-P, durham.org. And even if you're hearing this after the Impact Luncheon, still encourage you, go check them out. Find a way to get plugged in. There's so many different ways you can come alongside Step Up's work. Elizabeth is doing this work. She's got an amazing team, but also they could they need help. 
they need everybody to come alongside of them and, and find a way to, to fit into this story so that we can really be pressing in to love neighbor and help them amplify their impact. So even if you're dusting off an older episode and you're listening to this and it's the dead of winter, that website's still active. Get in there, <laughs> roll up your sleeves. Yeah, there's still time. Thank you so much for that, Rob. And Jess, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was delightful. I enjoyed this. I know Sarita and I know Step Up in the world because I'm in Durham. So of course we know the great work, but you provided a different lens today. One that I just so appreciate is deeper connectivity to the work. And I love that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friend. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Ah, man. I just feel like I need to take that energy and go run a long distance. Like she, Elizabeth is just one of those people. And when you have a blessing to know someone like that, I just, we all have that person in our lives where like every time you get a chance to be around them, it makes you better and it makes you want to be better. It it just inspires you. That's, she's on that list for me. And I'm just really thankful our listeners got to get a small taste of the amazing person that she is. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what are you processing? She gave us a lot in a short amount of time. She did. I Well, first of all, she's a powerhouse. So I'm just inspired, like you said, by her energy, but also her view, her perspective on the work and how excited she is to do this work every day and how she keeps very grounded. And there's just a lot of levels to her as a woman and as a professional and how she sees her life and this work that I'm interested in unpacking. So I was deeply impacted by the interview. I just think she's awesome. So I can't wait to follow her and find her after this just to stay connected. We need more people like that, I guess. It's like she made an indelible impression on me just in that short amount of time, just simply because she's super focused on the importance of this work and she Mm. seems tireless. And so I'm just like, how in the world are you doing that? And it's incredible. So there's that one takeaway. It's just Mm. her as a human. It's pretty cool. And then she said so much, but one thing again, personally for me that I'm tracking with, I'm probably going to think about this for a while. And and I'm probably going to talk about it (laughs) because I was like, this is so good. I don't know why right now it's resonating with me, but the example that she gave about her mentor or her friend who said that at the end of the night, just make, he just wants to know that he's poured everything out. Somehow that hit me a little differently today. Hmm. And I see that in her work. I see that's what she's doing. And I, when she said it, I might it might have hit me because I may be a little bit convicted. I don't know. Maybe it's because I have a lot going on, and I'm wondering if I'm pouring myself out in the ways that I need to in the work that I do. And so, mm. it's a good thought exercise. I haven't thought about that. I just go, and I'm wondering if our listeners just go. And some of the work that we want you to think about with the Just Podcast is maybe it's just that one thing. What's the one thing or the two things that you can literally pour yourself into in life? versus touching 10 things and just only scratching the surface. There's something about that. I think that might be helpful to, as a thought exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And not even, I think the way that she does that, it's important to note that she's others focused in that mm-hmm. pouring, right? Like she, she is totally. pouring out, not, and it, it is not an inward. And I think that's where, while COVID has been a very isolating thing for the world in the last 12 months, like, She's a person that never stops pouring themselves out for the sake of others. And I think that we, hopefully this podcast inspires our listeners to go and look, how can we go, how can I go and pour myself out so that others could benefit? How can I use my resources, my time, my talent, my treasure, right? What are all the ways that I've been blessed in which I can now go look to be a blessing to other people and leave leave it all out there, leave it all out on the field and make sure that we're, Cause you can tell like that she is running, but she needs people to be pouring into her. We all do. We all need people pouring into us. It's that mutuality, right? That's what I think she hit. Because when you hear her talk about her participants, there's this level of, Hey, we're all, we're in this together. We're the same. This isn't a doctor patient relationship. I'm not here to fix you. Like I'm here to pour into you. I need others pouring into me. We, there's ways we all can help each other. And I just, I love, I just think dignity is something that is one of those things when you find an organization that does things in a ways that honors the dignity of the people that they serve, doesn't yeah. pity them, right? But believes in them enough to know that I'm going to call you to great things because I see greatness in you. 
and we're going to work to until it's accomplished. It's just a beautiful thing. In, in the restoration narrative, talking about, hey, this was my story, but it's not your story today. It doesn't have to be your story tomorrow. We're going to write a new story for you. I think the thing that stuck out to me is that quote when she said, man, it's profound. I wish people would close their eyes and look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And man, Jess, if I don't need to do that more in my life, like I'm doing it right now as we're talking, I'm mm-hmm. like, we need yes. to close our lo- <laughs> our eyes so that we can see. Yeah. Because I, she's saying, man, if you're not careful, you'll look at, you'll look at our participants, you'll look at all, what we do and you'll miss some things that are really important because you don't have the sight. And I think a lot of times it, it takes us to closing our eyes, these stereotypes that we bring, these buzzwords that we fill out, right? About people who, who are being served, people who are on the margins of our society that have greatness in them. And yet we the need to be given second chances, right? Yeah. Whether that was of their own making or not, it doesn't, it, it's irrelevant, like the redemption. And I think we, we oftentimes come into these conversations already with our minds made up about how the world works. And I think for, and we all do that. And we all, to some extent, need to close our eyes so that we can see. Yep. That's a great note to end on. It is. It was her words. So I'm just, it lo- better let Elizabeth send us out, right? So there it is. Well, friends, great. if you if you haven't, go check out their website, stepupdurham.org. If, you ha- if you're listening to this live, go check out their fundraiser. Find out ways you can get plugged in. Until next time. Until next time. Thanks, friend. Thanks so much for listening to Just. In the spirit of sharing, if you like what you've heard, tell a friend about the show and give us a five-star rating and review. Many thanks to DJ P-Dog and producer Low Key for producing the music for our show. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 